Hello and hi, and thanks for coming back to the newly repaired alleyway. What's outside the alley? Nobody knows! If you're new and are here only because of that amazing thumbnail and title, I definitely didn't just make up on the fly an hour before uploading this, then nice to meet you! I'm writing a comic called Immortal, and this channel is for documenting my writing process and dumping all of my opinions and advice in a series of videos for other writers. And today we're going to talk about one of my personal favourite parts of world building. Mythologies and religion. <laughs> Gods and mythologies are really fascinating topics that, if included in a work of fiction, can really give the reader a deep insight into the world you're writing. And this is because a lot of writers tend to revolve their entire world culture around the religion their world follows. This is a pretty understandable way of writing. After all, on the surface, a lot of real world cultures are classified around their religions. And a fictional religion is able to establish rules for your world in the easiest, most organic way possible. By explaining the world around your characters, establishing their laws and social guidelines, and developing overall philosophies and ways of thinking. But of course, when writing from real life, we can sometimes fall into problematic territories when we take inspiration from religions that real people in the real world believe and follow today. So, for a writer, our best options will be to then base our fictional religions on a mythology. And for a long time, the mythologies that a lot of Western-centric writers took inspiration from were either Greek, Roman, Nordic, or Celtic mythologies. And this, I cannot stress enough, is fine. These are safe and familiar mythologies to take inspiration from. Again, particularly if your story doesn't center around your fictional religion. But one of the most distinct pitfalls with using mythology is that they're all already very well established in pop culture. This means you run the risk of creating a very samey religion that your audience will have seen a million times before in other works of fiction. And it can potentially just kill an audience's interest. But what's the other options we have? Well, you can follow the well-tread path and clip and paste together little bits of existing mythologies until they become what resembles an original idea. And that, again, is fine. Or, and hear me out, you can follow me into absolute insanity as we dive into what religions really are, how they came about, how they can change, warp, and grow organically within your story, and how we can build a belief system that is hopefully as original and true to your world story and themes as possible. Ready? Excellent! Let's start at the very beginning. Specifically, the very beginnings of religion. The concept of religion and spirituality, particularly throughout history, is an insanely deep topic that spawns from the dawn of humanity, with its earliest physical origins dating back anywhere from 45 to 70,000 years ago. With the earliest possible interpreted signs of religious practices and modern behavior dating back to potentially around 300,000 years ago, to theoretically around the first appearances of modern Homo sapiens. Now, to set some expectations, we are firmly in the red stream and thumbtack zone of archaeology when it comes to religious origins. But one thing I think we can agree on as people is that religions don't spring up overnight. There wasn't some homo Heidelbergensis out in Africa who woke up one day fully enlightened or anything. But there are loose theories that religion evolved alongside the homo sapien line, developing in small ways alongside tool creation and complex emotions, social behaviors, and the harnessing of fire. And while I personally really like the idea of this, it's important to note that that is mostly just speculation, and there is no tangible evidence of symbolic rituals until the end of human burials between 80 to 200,000 years ago. <laughs> Now that's a big gap, hear me out. The situation with human burials is complicated because we keep finding newer, older burial sites that push the dates of the first burial further and further back. Before people actually started thinking of Africa as a place with history, the oldest burials were thought to be in Europe and were dated to be about 45,000 years old. And then for a while in 2013, the oldest burial known was thought to be in Kenya. It was a child buried on their side with a pillow and blanket buried roughly 78,300 years ago, called Mtoto. And to this day, I believe they are still the oldest Homo sapien burial. 
But later that same year, a burial ground in the Rising Star Cave was found in South Africa, in the good old cradle of humanity. The Rising Star Cave was already a well-mapped attraction and contained a sprawling network of cave systems. And in the deeper, more unexplored sections of this tourist site, past a small crevasse known as Superman's Crawl, there lay an undiscovered cave containing a brand new, previously unheard of species that were dubbed Homo naledi. The small cavern was filled with thousands of bone fragments and fossilized skeletons, suggesting that this was a mass burial of the Homo naledi species in the area. There's also evidence, quote unquote, because it's still unconfirmed to a degree, to suggest that they were able to use fire and cook their food, as well as interesting crisscross carvings on the rock walls that could be interpreted as artistic in nature. But here comes the controversy, folks, because I fell down this rabbit hole and I am taking you all down with me. You see, this particular location was discovered by the paleoanthropologist Lee Berger. Berger has found the discovery of a lifetime, an entirely new human species with brains one third our size, capable of cooking, utilizing fire, creating artistic carvings and complex burial ceremonies, all in the same location. And as of yet, nowhere else. And according to him and his team, these buried remains date back to roughly between 200 to 300,000 years ago, predating the same behavior in Homo sapiens by over 100,000 years. And the way Berger has decided to conduct himself throughout this process has been particularly odd. <laughs> Apparently, he rushed a lot of the entire process for kind of no reason. He also introduced the media extremely early into the discovery, with National Geographic filming him and his research team throughout a lot of the early excavation process. He also initially announced a lot of his discoveries in press releases before they even had a chance to be peer-reviewed. And so it seems like he was encouraging a lot of media attention, which is pretty bad form in the academic world as I understand it. And this caused a decent bit of backlash within the archaeology community. And if that's not enough, he also garnered a lot of media publicity in 2006 after reporting the discovery of a new small-bodied dwarf species on the island of Palau in Micronesia. And this finding was also slammed by portions of the archaeological community who dismissed the findings as not a new species at all but a sign of island pygmyism in homo sapiens. All in all it's a very weird situation. I was genuinely baffled to learn all of this and really don't know what to make of it. Berger seems a bit suspect in his motivations when you look at his actions and past discoveries in context with one another. And so with that, I'm not going to say anything concrete because I'm like 80% certain anything I do try to say about this matter will age like milk. But I'm getting distracted. After burials, we find signs of religious practices. This is a bit fuzzy again, since with enough imagination, almost anything dug up could be interpreted as religious or iconic in nature. From those crisscrossed engravings on the rock walls, to handprints, to signs of specific fire usage. And from what I've found, it's the kind of thing that is just up to whoever interprets it that way. Since a lot of behavior that is seen as not strictly practical can be interpreted as religious. But anyways, what some believe is the oldest physical signs of religious practices is the Sodilo Hills stone snake. Researched by Dr. Sheila Colson and her team in Botswana, the snake cave is found in the Sodilo Hills and are also the location of what could be the earliest worship site. The cave is a marvel of human culture. With two main walls, the north wall is covered in what is thought to be painted depictions of white rhinos, and the south wall with a natural quartzite outcrop roughly 7 meters long and 2 meters high that has been ground down to form a series of grooves into the rock. This quartzite outcrop is known as the Sodilo Hills Stone Snake. And around 70,000 years ago, this naturally formed stone outcrop that looks kinda like a snake if you squint, was carved into to give it eyes and scales. Every divot in the stone is thought to be a single scale, making it appear like a snake. Some of the divots are very, very old, and some are rather new comparatively. In fact, the cave seems to have been utilized for thousands and thousands of years. The oldest paintings are thought to date back to roughly 20,000 years ago, while the newest are as young as only 
a thousand years old. And the Sodilo Hills are still considered a sacred space by the local San and Hambakushu communities today, as a location of worship and home to ancestral spirits, which I would tentatively suggest means it could potentially have been a sacred area for as long as those 70,000 years, which would be <laughs> incredible as a concept, but from my personal experience would probably be a little too cool to be real. And even more interestingly, the conditions of the cave means it wouldn't have been very suitable for habitation. Since water from up the mountain flows right through the cave when it rains, it wouldn't have been a very comfy or safe shelter in the rain. But excavations have revealed literally hundreds of stone tools in specific parts of the cave, notably directly under the snake itself suggesting that the tools were made on location, possibly with the intention of being used to carve the snake, which just adds to the mystery of how the cave was used and the exact nature of the worship being held. And that's the first real world evidence we have of burials and religious rituals. Moving on, let's talk about the other oldest religious signs we kind of, sort of, definitely, almost suspect we know about. The ones I researched are mainly in Europe and consist of quote-unquote skull cults and animist religions. There are a lot of theories about human evolutions and possible signs of religious acts that spring up throughout, from certain human skulls showing distinct signs of ritualistic cannibalism to the use of colored pigments like red ochre. But another interesting thing about religious symbols and patterns are these little statuettes known as Venus figures. Found between 40,000 and 10,000 BCE, the Venus figures are small statuettes carved from various materials such as horns, tusks, stone, and bones that depict picked female bodies with some rather exaggerated features and with either missing or abstract heads. These figures are some of the earliest signs of art we have alongside the oldest cave paintings. These Venus figurines are not only dozens of millennia apart, but were also found hundreds of kilometers apart all over Europe and up to Siberia. The design of some figures in particular particular the 45,000 year old Venus of Hollefels also suggests they were worn as pendants of some kind. And these consistent figures that were common enough that we've excavated multiple both in caves and in open air sites and were presumably worn as pendants form a pattern that looks suspiciously like religious worship. Although what exactly it was being worshipped is tentative at best and steeped in bias. The figures could represent a deity or a body type they could have been associated with life or fertility or used as protective symbols for safe childbirth. There could be links between the carved symbols found on some of the statuettes and the phases of the moon or menstruation. It's all up for interpretation and that means it's perfect for fictional inspiration. And even more curious, the proposed oldest Venus figure is the Venus of Barakat Ram, a rough looking pebble that kind of matches the Venus description. And while you could just look at the figure and assume its shape could be coincidental, it does show signs of being carved by flint tools and is dated to between 230,000 to 700,000 BCE. A number I hope you notice not only predates every other date I've talked about so far, but the latter number also far surpasses the existence of Homo sapiens. <laughs> Isn't history fun? The most universal signs of religious actions are, of course, burials. And aside from that first burial pit in Naledi and the younger one in Kenya, there are plenty of other burial sites that contain assorted grave goods like tools and animal skins, colored pigments, and other additions to buried bodies that couldn't just be explained through hygiene or practicality reasons. One of the examples of these was the 60,000-year-old La Chapelle ou Saint one a Neanderthal skeleton found in France. The Neanderthal was about 40 years old and in bad health at time of death, missing most of his teeth and suffering from advanced arthritis. The earth around the skeleton suggests it was buried and then covered over in a pretty recognizable burial style. And while that on its own is simple enough to be purely practical, multiple Neanderthal bodies have been found buried in the Shanidar cave in Iraq, suggesting it was a significant area for a potential culture that purposefully buried those bodies there. One of the more interesting of these bodies was Shanidar 1. 
a 30 to 45 year old with several healed over injuries and congenital illnesses that likely would have rendered him almost entirely deaf and blind in one eye. He also had a withered left arm that had several fractures with a third of it missing entirely. The point where the arm bone is cut off shows signs of possible amputation, also proposing the first evidence we have of Paleolithic era surgery on a living person. There was also Shanadar III, a 40 to 50 year old male who was killed by a stab wound, making him the oldest homicide case in history. Bone growth around the injury also suggests he lived on for seven weeks after the injury, presumably being tended to until he died. And then there was Shanadar IV, an adult male aged 30 to 45 years, who was found with hundreds of pollen samples infused into the soil around him. This then led to the theory that he was buried with hundreds of flowers and plants, many of which have been historically associated with medicinal or shamanistic properties. However, later it was theorized to most likely be the handiwork of a Persian jird, a species known for burying flower seeds, which seems to have convinced most archaeologists so who am I to argue? <laughs> And right after burials, we also have evidence of cannibalism that cropped up in European history, disturbingly often from the Middle Paleolithic and onwards, like this brutal case found in Goh's Cavern in England. Dating to 14,700 years ago, animal and human bones were found that had been defleshed, disarticulated, chewed on by human teeth, and cracked open to remove the marrow. And while this looks pretty bad. <laughs> it all could be explained through starvation or necessity, if it wasn't for the skull cups. Found scattered throughout Central and Western Europe are a series of skull cups that were um, filled with meat for the cannibals to eat from. And this is what is considered a ritual use of an object. After all, it's not like they needed to do that. Nobody was asking them to do that. <laughs> But mostly these cannibalistic practices seemed sacrificial in nature, with the predominant number of victims being women and children. But while we're on the skull train, let's jump to a different kind of worship, skull cults. Recently, the extraction of several skulls in Gobekli Tepe, considered the oldest temple to ever exist, has brought up the theory that 10,000 years ago human skulls were carved into deliberately, bored into in order to be looped like a pendant and hung up as gory decorations within the temple. Whether the skulls were taken to elevate and deify them or to serve as warnings or desecrations to the people and families they belong to are still unknown, <laughs> since the site is still very new, newer than the Naledi site. But before Gobekli Tepe, when people thought of skull cults, they thought of humans from the early to middle Paleolithic worshipping bear cults. And this was due to multiple excavations of bear skulls in multiple caves across Europe. But since then, the more common consensus is that animal skull cults didn't really exist and the skulls were more from the natural habit of bears to uh, live and also die in caves. There's also fire! Fire single-handedly revolutionized the evolution of humanity, allowing us to ward off predators, warm ourselves and light our environments, both cook and dry our food for long-term keeping, as well as allowing us to consume more calories in our diet, meaning we didn't have to consume as much raw food. But fire also did something else, revolutionize our social development. So with all that in mind, why wouldn't fire be seen as sacred or worthy of worship within a society? Well, although we cannot be certain of the presence of fire worship per se in pre-written periods, the earliest forms of worship were linked to solar or lightning deities. Only the Indo-European deity Agni in 1500 BCE was an actual pure fire deity, although it is very difficult to say whether he is the first of his type since, again, evidence here is rather limited and shrouded in mystery. Sacrifices, however, <laughs> we do have a lot of evidence for. Pits with animal bones have been discovered close to human burial sites, drawing a possible link towards the locations as either offerings to the dead or to a higher being, particularly since some of the bones found were of ox or reindeer skulls still left purposefully attached to the spines and rib cages, implying a ritual of some kind. There's also evidence of entire reindeer being sunk into lakes, an incredible waste of food that has to be deeply religious in nature in order to just justify why it would be done. And like I said before, in some cases cannibalisms were a form of sacrificial ritual. Sometimes the humans being cannibalized were eaten alongside young pigs too, which is very interesting. 
and also similar to fertility and agricultural rites performed in early Mediterranean civilizations too. Hunting rites were pretty common as well, with sections of the animal buried or burned or otherwise saved to please some kind of force. Typically, it seems these hunting rites were done after the hunt, with specific actions or rituals or dances being performed around or to the body. Most of these rituals are gleaned from the abstract art we found on cave walls though, and are mostly just speculation based on that and what we know about more modern hunting rituals. Evidence of animal cults are also commonly found almost universally worldwide, with cave art from the Upper Paleolithic largely representing animals and humans together and vague depictions of fused human-animal figures. Animals, of course, played a huge role in the everyday lives of these humans, and so the relationship between animal and man seems blurred in a lot of these anthropomorphic depictions, implying a deeper, early animist connection there that could have been the early beginnings of of animist religion, which is typically associated with tribalism and indigenous communities and is the common ancestor of religions like Jainism and Hinduism. Shamanism and sorcery are pretty closely related to these animal cults, with the anthropomorphic figures from before being dubbed as shamans. The shape-shifting shaman is an interestingly recurring symbol, being painted on caves in multiple locations around the world. From the 13,000-year-old Troy Frere, sorcerer depicted transforming into an animal to the therianthrope shamans painted fusing with animals in San art. There are assumptions and interpretations of evidence from the Iron Age and earlier that attribute magical abilities to both animals and these early sorcerers and other spirit-like figures who were capable of shape-shifting. In archaeology, as I understand it, it's pretty hard to differentiate between sorcery and religion, as they are ideologically opposed to one another in a sense, with religion being depicted as existence under the control of higher powers that are capable of being appealed to and approached by man, while sorcery is depicted as wild and impossible for humans to sway or manipulate. And in some cases, in hard times where religion falters, it can and has been known to completely consume cults and rob all of their objects and practices of its religious meaning. There is also art in general being used as a medium to channel religious beliefs, and able to visually show us so much more than what a few fragments of skulls and burials can. But again, art is subjective doubly so when it comes from 45,000-year-old artists. If you wanted to, you can read really deeply into the hand stenciled art on cave walls, which are some of the earliest paintings we have, which is just absolutely gorgeous, and you know why. It's beautiful and communal and a firm, proud declaration of the self, printed on a rock wall and exactly the kind of shout into the void of time that makes the heart weep. But while it could be seen as a sign of intellect and shows a sense of individuality and personhood within the artist, it doesn't clearly show any religious intention. Same goes for depictions of herds of animals and hunts, which is different to the shaman paintings like I said before, which are inherently supernatural and conceptually abstract in nature, just enough so to imply some kind of ritual or spirituality. Again though, we are estimating and assuming ideas based on on scraps of findings and assumptions. We can pretty much imply anything and everything from almost any creative action any human takes between 700,000 BCE and the invention of writing your own goddamn beliefs down. But what I want you at home to take away from all these examples I've shown is the many, many ways religion and religious practices can take shape. When we remove larger societal pressures and all but the barest technological achievements, we find that humans still create art and bury their dead and worship physical objects. They still pleaded and bargained to outside forces and created justifications for any action in the name of a higher power. To turn to the concept of magic or inhumane atrocities, all looking for ways to sway the world around them. It seems that to be human is to create stories and spirits and gods, to endlessly search for something more than the material world, and to always look for ways to change the tides of fate itself. 
Hello and hi again. Um, unfortunately, this video turned out way longer than I expected, uh, with the finished clips rounding up to about a 43 minute length, give or take. Um, and so I've cut it down in half with part two currently being edited now and on its way soon. I'm really sorry to do this, especially since most of the actual writing part of this writing video is actually in the second half. Um, and this was more just real world logic to back it up with. But it was either cut it down or make you all wait for another month or so and I'm already over schedule by about five months so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon to discuss anthropological classifications for religions, advice on how to create an overarching mythology and how I write my own. Until then a huge thank you to Vincent P for fact checking and proofreading the script. This video would not exist without you and I'll see you next time with completely different but not necessarily better audio quality. Thank you so much much for watching and see you next time.